So, Karan, let's get the easy stuff out of the way right now. The easiest part of the book, right? right. Why is India obsessed by your sexuality? Easy. Uh, <laughs> well, that's the, it, the, the... For some reason, as I said, the word conjecture is a word I use very often on my, on my talk show. Uh, well, that is because when people don't have final answers, they tend to kind of, you know, browse around the topic always. And so have I. And, uh, but in the book, um, I've said what I felt the need to, and I've said it in a way that I felt I needed to express it. Um, and there's really nothing more to say, so I think that every answer anyone's looking for is in the book. You know, there are several moments in that book where you talk about people confronting you at airports, yeah. at parties, and saying the most gross things, the most insensitive things, and you come back to them, is sassy but also a little sad why do you have to why should anyone have to explain any aspect of their lives at all or defend it i think why? Pe people sometimes um, you know when you're in the celebrity zone i think people tend to sometimes just not know what to say like i feel like when they encounter you uh, they either tend to overcompensate and and say exceptionally polite things or they'll say the most inappropriate things to you i think anyone who's been in the celebrity space will tell you that you'll have people come and say the most over familiar things to you at times and sometimes because they think that they own you because you're in their living room on a daily basis perhaps because of the, my television exposure or the fact that one is around and and all over the place they feel they have an ownership over you and sometimes that allows them to kind of cross the boundary of decency and they'll say things that are inappropriate and you'll have to stand there sometimes you can give a response back which sometimes goes over their head because it's not a straight lined answer and sometimes you use sarcasm which also sometimes doesn't get a response sometimes all you do is just you know like 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 Shah Rukh told me the other day uh, that now when people say things he just just nods because, he, because there's nothing else to say. Sometimes you just nod. Because people say the most bizarre things. And it's not, it's, sometimes it's, it's members of, of the fraternity, sometimes it's members of the media within the fraternity, sometimes it's random strangers at an airport, like, and you have to just deal with it. There's nothing you can do. You can't, at least I'm not the guy who's going to start getting into a, a, a fight, because that's, I don't think I'll have um, the ability to handle it if I was at the receiving end. So uh, I, I just let it pass. May I share that one moment at the airport, which is in your book, so everyone's going to read it anyway, right. where a person comes up to you, uh, he, uh, his wife is with him, and he walks up to you and say, says to you, so are you a homo? Yeah. And your response is, why? Are you interested? <laughs> and I thought that was just fabulous. That's, you know, the aplomb that and the tight slap that probably the man warranted. Well, it was, I, 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 it was what came out, uh, like literally it just came out very, um, because I thought it was an exceptionally inappropriate say thing. And the wife was clicking a photograph of mine while he was asking me this question. And he asked me, patting me on my back. It wasn't just a car, it was an over familiar pat. Like as if like I had, like, like we had dinner last night and he decided to ask me this question early in the morning. And it's happened to me, it's also in the book when I was on uh, the launch of a channel and it was an early morning breakfast interview where I was asked an inappropriate question and I was, I was completely shocked that we were on national television. Of course, it never made it because they realized that it was completely wrong. Luck, fortunately, it wasn't a live telecast. But sometimes you just wonder whether people just don't have the sensitivity or the decency or to sometimes use language to ask a question that may not come across inappropriate. There are various ways. We are all, I'm a member of the media myself, I host a talk show. And I know sometimes when you want to kind of ask something, you can circumvent it with words and vocabulary. You don't suddenly just go up there and ask in the, pre in the pretense of being completely candid or then uh, irreverent or perhaps over familiar. But you know, the surprising part of the book, uh, towards the end of the book, when you talk about um, maybe going on to dating sites, I found that fascinating, that you went on to an elite <coughs> dating site and a date was set up for you in Tokyo. And you said, why should I go to t Tokyo to meet someone? How well, did you get onto these uh, dating sites? I that's mean, why? a story in itself. Uh, yeah. Sometimes you have to kind of scratch the surface to find, uh, you know, what's not immediately available. Uh, so there are various ways and means I think people sometimes have to kind of look at. Um, when you're single and 44, 
you'll probably go through every kind of possible available opportunity. I thought that was fantastic because most people would not admit it. I would have actually They'd liked to give the name. But they won't. It was a selective. I would have liked to give in the name, but they are so exclusive and and quiet and uh, have full like you know disclosure issues. Uh, so that's why I didn't give that information. Not that anything's come out of it, and I'm not a success story of their agency at all. Um, in fact, I'm a rather uh, apparently two out of three people succeed, and I'm that one who failed. You've also talked about uh, three and a half failed relationships. One true love and I think three and a half failed relationships. You've spoken about it with uh, a great deal of some, some amount of regret and but compassion, empathy about why they didn't work out. Well, they were not any relationships. They were mostly unrequited love situations, uh, which is great fodder for a filmmaker, not so great for a personal life. Um, yeah, I mean, I suppose that comes from your sense of indulgence uh, and over-expectation. Sometimes you tend to expect from quarters that you know won't deliver, and that invariably happens when, you know, you. and that's what I call indulgence, is like if I had a pragmatic approach to love, uh, which is not possible with me, I would possibly have been in a long-standing relationship, but I've always desired what I know I can't have. You also talked about uh, divorce being the new marriage. And throughout the book, there is a kind of a, st uh, a strand which keeps going back to infidelity. And it's like almost a semi-obsessive uh, aspect of your creative process to, to deconstruct everybody's marriages and to see who's well, cheating, I, who's lying, well, who's, I don't, who's I living don't, a lie. Because truly, in my experience, I think there's much to do about fidelity and infidelity. I think sometimes true emotion and relationships can go beyond those. And being a single bystander, you tend to be so close to so many relationships and marriages. And in my experience, and I say this, I with, and I don't have any kind of, um, with, with all kinds of moral policing on my statement, I'm sure, but I don't think infidelity is a deal breaker. I don't think, I don't believe it's it is. not a deal breaker. No, I don't think so. And I feel like people, it's very individualistic, it's as per each one's life. And I feel like I'm not judgmental about it at all. And I'm not sure if I'm capable of complete fidelity, even if I was deeply in love. But in your film, when you're talking about the process where you were going to shoot the scene, very interesting uh, conversation that you had with uh, Shah Rukh, when all of you had second thoughts, <coughs> whether to go all the way and show Rani and him in bed or suggest that they've actually had sex, where you were advised against it and even Shah Rukh was not sure whether it should have uh, that scene or it should be like the Meryl Streep scene where yeah. it ends without them actually well, I doing was, it. I was in, an, in a zone of abandon at that time. You know, I was like, I felt I, I had wings. I wanted to fly as a filmmaker. But when I look back, I feel like, um, I remember very clearly, and I've said it, that when the scene was going on, I was watching it at a preview, um, and there was a very traditional couple watching it, and the moment Shah Rukh and Rani check into the hotel in Kabi Alvida, the lady turned to her husband, and he said, don't worry, dream sequence hai. Uh, and, and, and because they imagined that this is not possible. You know, in a, in a Karan Johar film, it's not possible that this would actually transpire. And the moment they realized it was not a dream sequence, five minutes later they were out of their cinema halls. So I realized that, you know, sometimes topics like this are brushed under the carpet in our society. We don't like to watch what is startling and truthful on celluloid. We like to watch virtue and morality, say the right messaging. The moment you make viewing uncomfortable, the moment you say things that hit you hard, those are the films that bother you the most and you have extreme reactions. Kabi Alvida had extreme reactions. I had people come and say, I hated it. The only reason you can hate it if it's the truth of your home and it's the truth of your marriage. You can't hate that film otherwise. Or had people say, it's uncomfortable to see this film with my spouse because what do you say after? Oh, I love the film, what did you love about it? You know, if I hated it, then why did you hate it so much? You know, so it's, it's basically, it was more a commentary. So the film did so much, and someone told me that it did so much better in the West because there, there's a culture of watching film alone. So there are men who went alone and women who went alone. But in India, we go as a couple or as a family, and it's an uncomfortable watch sometimes. I think that's changing. I see a lot of movies on my own in a theater, and I enjoy it thoroughly. I think I see a lot of other ladies also coming and watching movies. It's changing. Thank God. <laughs> Uh, there's a wonderful chapter on Shah Rukh where the first time you meet him and you go with a certain baggage because A, you're awestruck, you expect to meet a big star and you're completely disarmed because he's so normal, he's warm, he's caring, he's very respectful towards your father. They have a relationship 
completely independent of i mean it was uh, i remember the day so clearly etched in my head like it's it's like it happened yesterday um i grew up with movie stars that were stalwarts that were luminaries that we literally looked up to like mr bachchan you know when he walked into the room there was a sense of like you know like like glory someone magnificent has walked in so there was this stardom that i had read as being a producer's son stars were always put on a pedestal we were always the poorer parties we were the ones that had to kind of succumb to their stardom look up to their uh, full of awe because they were the ones who made the movies happen so i grew up feeling movie stars were like unapproachable entities i had then lost track with the generation because i was in my college days and i was touching base with my father's side of the business much later when he took me to meet uh, sharuk to sign him for duplicate and i had never met somebody who was a young movie star who was so loved at that time and everyone wanted him in 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 their movies who was this animated this conversational this uh uh what do i say just this this real person so i was in shock and the fact that he respected my father so much the fact that he showed that respect meant the world to me because up to that point i felt like my father had not had the best run at the movies um you know even with certain people and relationships and when i saw sharuk give him that love i think i fell in love with sharuk at that moment because i saw the love he gave my father and that to me meant the world nothing else mattered there's a lovely insight also when you talk about your father i think that was beautiful where you said that uh, despite him achieving success by the time you started working together in his head he was still um, like a production person so it was his instinct to carry the bags of stars or open car doors for them and, and which my I, mother went horse yeah, trying to tell him yeah. yash you're a producer you're not a production manager you can't you shouldn't be doing these things it's but it was that his you instinct it. it was his instinct he couldn't help it he just couldn't like whatever and it was like and i of course was born like i was a movie star in my head even though i had nothing in my head i was always royalty uh, for some reason i don't know where my mother always said i don't know where you came from uh, because you know i do, i don't I didn't have their value system and i was always somebody who lived beyond my means uh, it was because i was pampered by my father it was he allowed me to believe that he really when i was 150 kilos fat thought i had 5 kilos of puppy weight that i should lose uh, he thought i was the most gorgeous looking son i was could have been a film hero knowing very well i knew my personality would not allow me to be a lead in a hindi film at all but he thought he could have launched me when we were talking about my first film he said tu thoda patla ho ja tu kar sakta hai hero ka kaam and i was like at that point i was like how do i get love and and balance it with delusion uh, because you know my mother secretly i think always knew that i was not meant for certain things but my father just loved me unabashedly there's a also a wonderful moment that you, uh, you talk about when kajol who you now don't have the same relationship with any longer but maybe you will in in future when she told you that if you want to establish your um, you want to assert yourself on the set just come and shout the hell out of me just come and yell at me to show that you're the boss and you were faking i mean you were faking it she was faking it but i thought that was very generous of her and very smart of her to think of that you were young you were nervous she was a huge star and she says just come out there and shout at me yeah and it's true did. it's what happened it's what's in the book uh, as are many other things uh, kajal i think enough has been said about recently especially when excerpts of the book have been out uh, so i don't want to say any more about the fact that we have great history and i want to remember just the history that we've shared this is part this is a moment in that history of nearly 25 years of a of a friendship and uh, yeah sometimes chapters end books end relationships end but yet the, you talk about when you hugged sharuk at the pickers party and suddenly whatever tension there may have been melted away that one hug there was so much love that uh, was exchanged and it was all eliminated i Any think there was never there, there are never there are ups and downs in so many relationships but with charok it's uh, um there is deep love there's no other way of of communicating the respect and love that i have for him um and i believe that ours will be a dynamic and ours will be a relationship and ours will be a connect that will be forever it's only because my love for him has has only grown over the last two decades my love for his family has been so constant and consistent and the fact that i think that their home is like 
a home for me in this city means a lot to me and my mother. Um, my love for him is beyond work. My love for him and his family is beyond what he and I do professionally. It really is now a soul connect. I think we were meant to meet in this world and I think it's because of my father that we have this connect and we could possibly have our down days and our humongously up days but what we cannot ever forget is the unabashed love that will remain and the respect, more importantly, uh, that I think is, has not been diminished, no matter what. It has a lot to do with uh, both of you being successful, very successful in your own right. You say that, that friendships in show business can only succeed if the two people involved are equally successful. Is there something like friendship at all in showbiz? I've made some very strong friendships. Everyone in this room today is from my industry. Um, I, my relationships define me. Um, I, we're low on family. We have very few relatives that we're really connected with, me and my mom. So most of my personal connections are my family, and they're my extended family. I've made the most amazing relationships. In fact, um, I say this to Gauri, um, that I think I'm one of the reasons why I made her love people in the movies. Because uh, when she was initially, when she came in, she was so reluctant to meet people because everyone comes with baggage. But some of my most deep equations and my most solid dynamics have been with people from the movies. So I think it's very unfair to say that relationships, yes, you go through ups and downs and there are always uh, turbulent times. But I have to say that the soul and heart I found within the fraternity and the industry um, has been amazing and I will cherish those relationships for the rest of my life. They've, they're all still there in my life. In fact, I'm a very constant person. People who've been in my life for over two and a half decades are still there in, in a very strong space. And finally, your book ends with your expressing a desire to perhaps adopt a child or have a surrogate child and you talk about this child as your uh, old age kind of um, uh, policy to insurance policy in old age. Is I think uh, you have reason. I feel I have a nurturing quality in me and I saw that most when, uh, when I launched Alia, Varun and Sid. Um, I felt like they, I can't let go of them even now. Like I feel it's been nearly five years and I feel no matter what they do in whatever capacity they do, when they're on screen or they're at an event or they're anywhere, I see myself staring at what they're doing, what they're saying. So that shows that I, I actually have a sense and even all the directors in Dharma, everyone in Dharma, to me, I'm maybe age-wise, say a decade apart from them, maybe more than that. But the emotion comes from a very strong paternal space. And I feel like I would like to take that forward. I don't know what I'm going to do about it, but I feel like I would like to be a parent. I don't know in what capacity. I don't know how it's going to happen. I have no clue and I don't have answers to those questions. But I do feel the need because I feel I have love to offer. And since it's there and I'd like to take it forward because I feel like that paternal instinct needs to be acted upon. And I feel it very strongly. Like I feel like I have so much within me that I conserve and I feel that love has to have a release, you know, and it's not going into a relationship. It goes abundantly to my love for my mother and my friends and, and all of them around me in my company. I love everyone. And I like, to me, I'm, I don't think any of them uh, will realize how deeply moved I am that so many of them are here today um, and what they mean to me in my life. I sometimes don't express it enough uh, because it's within me and, you know, and I feel like that love within me needs to find a platform. And I think that platform could be a parent platform. Karan, I wish you every, every success. I hope a baby does come into your life. It'll transform you. It transforms everybody who's ever had a child. And I can tell you that from experience. With uh, four <clears throat> grandchildren now, I can tell you that with double experience. Yes. So blessings all the way. Make it happen for yourself. We are very proud of you. We are very proud of the book. It's already a bestseller. And uh, it's got its first brilliant review. So it's a day to celebrate. And may you always remain the wonderful, caring person you are. Thank, Thank you. you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, first of all, Mili Ashwarya, thank you for publishing the book. Shobha, for convincing Karan to write a book. And all his friends who are here, I'm sure, who have formulated his life, who have uh, 
uh, you know, done things in his life which comprise of the book that he's written. And uh, Karan, it's a wonderful thing that you've done. I think uh, yours is an extremely beautiful life. Yours is an extremely important life that people should read about. Uh, I don't know if people will learn or not, but it's important to know of your experiences. Uh, my only uh, questioning part of this whole book is uh, the title. Uh, I find that a little different. It could have been titled anything. It could have been titled according to me, apart from the unsuitable boy, it could have been the, the good boy. <laughs> yeah, he's a good boy. Uh, if his father was here, he would vouch for it. His mother is here, she would uh, vouch for it all the time. You know, there are very few boys who sit down with their mothers, sit down with their mothers at night and discuss tele-shopping. <laughs> he does that at 3 a.m. Wherever he is, in the middle of a party, but he'll come back and he'll say, Mom, I have heard that tele-shopping network has come to a new let's sit down and buy. <laughs> That's a good boy. Uh, he's an intelligent boy, I think. That's what the book could have been called. And intelligent not in terms of uh, just general knowledge or Wikipedia stuff or the stuff we all read on Google, but he understands things, he understands people, he realizes situations, he walks into a room and he knows what's happening. And uh, I find that extremely um, gifted. I think he has a gift from God that he can understand people and use it intelligently. Um, and even with me, if I may say so, there are very few people who can keep up conversations with me because I'm such a genius. But really, I say that with humility and modesty. But he's been able to have uh, conversations with me, the best conversations I've had in my life, late into nights in New York or here. Or sometimes when I'm just alone, I call Karan and say, let's just talk. Uh, he is perhaps one of the most intelligent conversationalists and speakers that there is at a personal level, at a professional level, or at any given level. And if he doesn't know it, he can wing it really, really well. Um, I think he's a very sensitive boy. That's what the book could have been called. Um, and it's a personal experience because I have the inability to express my feelings. I have oversensitivity issues. I am complexed and damaged. But I realize that the only person, apart from my family now, who can give me the space or figure out how I'm feeling uh, has been only Karan. He can make out that Bhai is angry, Bhai is sad, can't say this to Bhai. And it's not just me. I've seen, seen him being sensitive to everybody around, from the youngest of people, his team of student of the year, to the eldest of them all. And he can understand what is happening in your heart, what is happening in your soul. He's an extremely, extremely wonderfully gifted, sensitive person. The book could have been called <clears throat> The brave boy, and I say this with vehemence and conviction, because Karan is different. He's extremely different. And not just in the unique sense, he's different. And it's difficult being different. Especially in our country, in the world we live in, the society that we have to face, he's just different. And to achieve what he has done, with the gusto that he's done this, with the aplomb that he's achieved this, is even beyond the greatest of achievements. Because to be different, and to do, and be accepted, and to run wild and free in this world is a very, very special thing. I know him very personally. I haven't read the book. I don't know how much of the difference comes out in this book. But he is a different boy. He is a unique boy. And last but not least, when I say this, he is genuinely an extremely brave boy. And he's all of these, put together, he makes a very special boy. To me, Karan Johar will always remain the most beautiful boy that I've ever seen in my life. And I'm extremely honored to be here. And I don't say it just because we're at a function and you're supposed to say this about a guy who's releasing his book. I'm extremely honored, genuinely. You know, there are different uh, uh, aspects you think of yourself, when, you are, when, when I was young, I thought if I get an X amount of awards, I would have arrived. If I got an interview with so-and-so journalist, I have arrived. If I made it to the cover of a magazine, specific one, oh, I have arrived. I genuinely believe 25 years of work, 51 years of age, I truly, truly, and I thank you from the bottom of my heart for this, I truly believe my children, my wife, 
and myself. We truly have arrived because I have a full chapter in your book. So thank you so much. <laughs> God bless you. And may Allah give you happiness, health, goodness, children, many of them, and everything that you ever wanted. God bless you and thank you for calling me here and giving me such an honor. Thank you.